I think, hello everybody. I think we're, we had a false start. So I'm going to reintroduce the speaker. Uh, my apologies. Uh, are we live now? Anchor, can you just give me a, a wave? Okay, thank you. So my name is Thomas Cruz. I am joining you from uh, the uh, from University of Arizona in Tucson. And uh, it's my pleasure to moderate this session, which is on Hippocampus. Uh, we have two great speakers today. I am joined as co-moderators by Soledad Cunio, uh, uh, Gonzalo Cunio in uh, Norway and Tom Burns in Japan. They will step in if uh, something happens to my stream. In any case, uh, we're a little bit uh, late because of this false start. So I'm going to leave it to Andrea, who is um, uh, from uh, Computer Science Department at Instituto Cajal in Madrid. Uh, to start our presentation on evolutionary algorithms to explore single cells, heterogeneity, and microcircuits operation in the hippocampus. Andrea, up to you. Thank you very much. So, hi, everybody, again. <laughs> uh, I am Andrea Navas Olive. I am a PhD student at Laboratorio de Circuitos Neuronales in Madrid, Spain. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the Organization for Computational Neuroscience for choosing my work for this feature talk. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, how did we use evolutionary algorithms, well, a kind of evolutionary algorithms called genetic algorithms, to explore single cell heterogeneity in hippocampus and how this heterogeneity is reflected at the microcircuit level. Uh, so let's start with this picture. Maybe it's not the best picture to start a talk, but why? Because it's too complex. And again, why? because it has too many different elements in it. Well, and that's precisely why I want to start here. The hippocampus was thought to be a, a structure where the information flowed linearly from the entorhinal cortex to the gyrus up to CA1. But this rapidly evolved into the picture you, know, you are now seeing. Not only shark cuts like these ones, or recurrent connections like these ones, were discovered. Also, as, uh, also site, uh, cell type specific, specific connectivity and functionality from many diverse cells. CA1 is the perfect example. It was not so many years ago when it was first shown that fighting dynamics of pyramidal cells uh, were, were divided, uh, were, uh, sorry, uh, were different between the deep and the superficial layer. So, uh, the pyramidal cells from CA1 were divided into deep and superficial cells, both with different functionality, connectivity, and intrinsic properties. Here we have a genetic analysis of these two neuron types. We can see that gene expression in deep uh, here and in superficial cells are, uh, are different, being these genes responsible for both intrinsic and synaptic pro properties. Here we could ask ourselves, is, is this the mechanism underlying self-specific functionality? However, great models such as Besides, which is a realistic full-scale model of the CA1 microcircuit, meaning it has the same number of neurons as in a rat CA1, lack this heterogeneity. All model neurons from each population have the same intrinsic and synaptic properties. And this also happens in artificial neural networks, which most of them rely on identical units. But this is not all. <laughs> During one of the most important hippocampal rhythms, the theta rhythm, a slow rhythm from 4 to uh, 12 Hertz, that it is responsible for information processing during navigation, both inhibitory and excitatory inputs are distributed along all phases. In this picture, you can see the outside ring is representing excitation. And you can see how excitation covers almost all theta phases, from the peak to the trough and, and going on. And the middle ring is uh, representing the inhibition, the interneurons, and they cover all they are across all the theta phases. Just a comment for later, all these populations, both the excitatory and inhibitory, are theta modulated. 
That means that it's firing, it's uh, it's more or less always in the same theta phase. For example, in here, we can see that in the renal cortex layer three, is it almost fire, its preferred phase, you can see that way, is around the theta peak. Uh, okay, so in here we have a very high dimensional input from many different populations. And how is the neuron response? Given also all the heterogeneity we were uh, saying before, not only the, for the pyramidal neurons, also all the different in the neurons and also the excitatory inputs. How is the neuron response? It's bimodal. It's bimodal. <laughs> so the, we see that we saw that the, there are two main preferred theta phases, and uh, we used a single cell recording and labeling in vivo uh, in mice and rats. And what we saw it's that the superficial neurons tend to fire in the trough of the stratum pyramidal uh, theta here. You can see that all these uh, lines are the, the firing uh, along the, the different theta phases of each one of these, each one single cell, one neuron. And superficial cells tend to fire in the trough, while deep cells tend to, fi tend to fire in the peak. And we can see here the same. There are some neurons firing at the trough and some neurons firing at the peak. Here you can see the, the histogram of the preferred theta phases that are described with these white lines, and they are bimodal. Uh, a statistical analysis revealed that, yeah, uh, they were uh, separated also by, by cell specific, uh, cell type specificity. So, uh, uh, in the peak and in the trough, in the peak there were deep cells and in the trough there were uh, superficial cells. Uh, okay, so uh, we have here like a kind of cell type specific dimensionality reduction performed by neurons because they get a multidimensional excitatory and inhibitory input and somehow they lay uh, they they have a very di a low dimensional output. Uh, we think that heterogeneity at a cellular and a microcircuit level play a key role in understanding how the hippocampus operates, and that's why we decided to build a realistic model of, heter of the heterogeneous properties. Uh, we took a reconstructed neuron from Neuromorpho and perform a genetic algorithm uh, looking for this heterogeneity. And the uh, genetic algorithm goes as follows. We had uh, several number of individuals, 45, and each individual uh, is defined by a set of computational genes. In this example, gene one uh, is represented the, um, the A potas potassium ion channel density and has one value. And the last gene is representing the axial resistance with another value. So we have a bunch of uh, individuals with uh, random genes starting in generation one. We evaluated each individual with, with a given target function that returned a certain score. 30% of individuals with highest score remain for next generation. A random 20% of the remaining individuals was also retained. And the rest of them were completely new, like resetted with uh, completely random genes. There's also a mutation rate. Uh, so 40% of random individuals suffered a mutation of one of their genes. That is, these genes were changed. And uh, we keep uh, this process on going from generation to generation up to generation 100. We ended up here with, low, with uh, 45 uh, individuals with very different sets of genes with high scores fitting their target uh, function. Going into specifics, we took this uh, al uh, genetic algorithm to constrain the intrinsic parameters that were ion channel densities and axial resistance also. Uh, the, target, the target function was an input-output curve uh, that measures the spiking frequency given a certain current amplitude of current injection. Uh, so in green, you can see the target. 
uh, with uh, certain variability. And uh, these dots, connected dots, are the input-output curves of different uh, individuals, of uh, different uh, morph individuals in this morphology. Uh, and the black ones are the ones that fitted the target function, the input-output target function, and the gray ones, the ones that didn't, that has a low score. Uh, we also did the same thing. They applied the genetic algorithm to take the synaptic, to constrain the synaptic parameters, which were the maximal synaptic conductances. And for this, uh, we took the, the result from my bibliography from this paper, in which uh, C three uh, was uh, there was an excitation and in, a current injection in C A three that activated some populations on CA1. And here we can see, uh, again, like an input-output curve, but synaptic, synaptic input-output curve, sorry. Uh, the line green is the response for uh, superficial neurons and the red one for deep neurons. So we took this um, as, at, as our target functions, uh, function, uh, which is this here in blue. And again, we can see how the uh, different individuals uh, were or inside the target function, here those in black, or outside the target function. These, were, these will probably be changed after the, uh, some generations. Okay, so with here, we have uh, like a, a great pool of uh, sets of intrinsic and synaptic parameters upon one uh, morphology. We have a lot of diversity, but just in one morphology. We also want diversity in morphologies as they are the, the bodies that perform the integration, the input integration. Um, we did not perform this procedure, this same genetic al algorithm procedure for another morphologies. We took another three morphologies because we wanted shared properties between all the morphologies to be able to compare them. So instead of that, we uh, did the following. We took uh, 20 random intrinsic uh, sets from the fitted in the first my, uh, the fitted pool from the first uh, morphology. And we propagated them into the other three morphologies and evaluated we, uh, evaluate them with, this, with the same intrinsic target function. If an individual didn't target, uh, didn't fit the target in all morphologies, in all the morphologies, then it was uh, discarded and we took another one from the pool. This was a validation, a, a validation process, an iterative one, until we end up with 20 individuals uh, fitting the, in, the intrinsic input-output curve for all morphologies. We performed this same process with synaptic factors, although here uh, it was very difficult to accomplish that all synaptic um, uh, sets uh, fitted the, the morphology. Uh, the fitted in the in the in all the morphologies the intrinsic the synaptic input output curve sorry so we were uh, a bit more flexible but now let's go to the to the fun part uh, how do these synthetic cells behave in an oscillatory regime in order to simulate theta oscillation we distributed the synapses, the synapse connections uh, of both the excitatory and inhibitory populations uh, in a realistic way. So not only synapses were distributed along the morphology according to bibliography, we also, uh, the, the uh, time distribution was, um, uh, was fit in the, the experiments. Uh, before I told you that uh, most of the populations were theta modulated, meaning that they had like a preferred phase. And here we can see, for example, the PB interneuron uh, mostly fires in the descending part of the theta. With him as a CA3, for example, CA3 also fires mostly in the descending part, uh, different from CA2 that mostly fires, for example, in the trough. Here we have all the input the excitatory and the inhibitory inputs and here we have the output from one of our synthetic cells in black you can see the membrane potential 
of the soma in the soma and the the lighter the gray uh, of these traces is uh, further in the apical dendrite you can see obviously these uh, spikes but we can see also some uh, other interesting properties of the uh, of these traces for example back propagation so here we have a spike and the spike propagates into the apical dendrite uh, like in here we also have uh, dendritic spikes as in here and we also had dendritic spikes that uh, provoked uh, um, a spike uh, yeah firing in the cell okay so but here we have one of our synthetic cells how about uh, we see more <laughs> um, if instead of lo if looking at the traces a long time we take the firing uh, histogram, uh, the spiking histogram, we can see in here different spiking histograms for the same individual, that means it has the same intrinsic properties, but across different uh, morphologies, our four morphologies. We can see uh, in the bottom the firing histogram and in the upper part the membrane potential in the soma black then in the middle and the lighter is the uh, distal apical uh, dendrite and what we see is that even the the intrinsic properties are the same integration is not because the output is different so here we can see that this morphology uh, performs a bimodality output while this one and also this one mostly fires around the the, la the latter part of the descending uh, slope or the trough and this one just the opposite it fires mostly in the peak uh, well and we can see also that the, the the traces reflect this same spiking uh, here i've just i've just shown one individual let's see more the individual from the slide before is the second row uh, another individuals are in other rows that means that uh, all these rows so this row has the same intrinsic properties different from the intrinsic properties of this row that are different from this one oh, each row is one individual and in different uh, different morphologies each of these column is a different morphology and what we see here more or less the same as before there's variability not only across morphologies also within one morphology across different individuals so here for example we can see one this morphology it depends on the individual it fires at the peak or at the trough or almost doesn't fire at all uh, we can see the same in the uh, the individual uh, level we can see that uh, this this intrinsic properties makes make these two uh, synthetic cells almost silent while these ones uh, in this morphology it almost fires almost always at the uh, at the peak and here in the descending part and it's the opposite in here which these neurons uh, fire less and in here we have one in the trough uh, in the peak and one in the trough another way to see this more compacted is taking the preferred phase that is computed as the maximum of each of these uh, uh, histograms across the different morphologies and see how is a histogram of the preferred phases for each morphology and here are the results we can see that uh, most of the preferred phases are or in the trough in the trough or in the peak in the peak trough and trough so here we have an example of a non-fitted phenomenon, this bi the bimodality we saw in the experimental da data coming along. Maybe this is not enough to validate this model. We can go one step further and test the model with a prediction. Uh, we know from uh, experiments that the CCK and PV basket cell interneurons uh, connect differently with superficial and deep cells. Uh, in particular, CCK basket cells innervate more superficial and less deep, and PV basket cells innervate more deep and less superficial. And we also know that the CCK basket cells 
fires most, mostly in the peak, while uh, PV basket cells mostly fire in the descending part. We, we can perform a computational experiment uh, trying to, to seek in like a deep like uh, synthetic cell, lowering the CCK. We could do also uh, increasing PV, but if we increase inhibition, then the, the model <laughs> won't fire or we would need a lot of more time to, to achieve uh, the same number of spikes. So we decided to lower the CCK to do uh, deep-like cells and lower the PV to do uh, soup -like, superficial-like cells. Here we have the mean, uh, the, the mean membrane potential. Uh, and well, I haven't said that these are um, perisomatic inhibition. So here we can see that the, the, the membrane potential <clears throat> in the apical dendrite is almost the same for both uh, experiments, uh, lower in CCK or lower in PP. But there's, uh, the, but uh, we can see uh, that here at the somatic level, there's a difference. So when we lower CCK, the neuron fires where the CCK was supposed to be in the peak. And when we lower PV, then the neuron tends to fire when the, where the PV was supposed to be in the descending part, making these two neurons like deep, like deep because it's fi it, fire it fires mostly in the peak or soup like because, because it fires mostly in the trough. Uh, we can see the, the, this in a more nicely way in uh, spiking histograms. Uh, in black, we can see like the basal state where uh, there's no lowering. And uh, in blue, we see the lowering CCK that fires mostly as, as we said in the peak, 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 peak. And lowering the PB basket cell that it, then it fires mostly in the, in the descending part or even at the uh, trough. Uh, in the bottom, uh, there's, it's, no, it's not related with this PV CCK, if you want to see that way, but in fact, it, yes, it is related. Here we uh, removed all inhibition, not only CCK and PV, but all inhibition. There's just excitation. And you see that there's like an, a more or less intrinsic bimodality without uh, inhibition and what maybe CCK and PV is doing upon this um, no inhibition state is choosing between one of these two windows of opportunity. So when CCK is present, then uh, this window of opportunity is chosen and vice versa. Uh, before, I told you about the full-scale Bethaire model, that it's very cool, not only because it's full-scale, but also because uh, the theta rhythm is generated spontaneously with tonic excitation, without rhythmic excitation. We wanted to see if the CCK and PV lowering in this model also gave rise into deep-like and sub-like uh, cells. For that, we used the Neuroscience Gateway, that is a supercomputing center and that is free for uh, neuroscience research and very easy to use. I, I really liked it and recommend it. And here we can see the, the results. We performed the experiment lowering uh, CCK and PB. Um, but we couldn't get these superficial and deep like cells. Uh, we were quite surprised and disappointed also. <laughs> uh, but later we realized that the local fit potential, the clock by which, uh, by which we measure the theta phase, is computed from pyramidal cell spiking. So by definition, pyramidal cells are going to be fi uh, firing always at the trough. So we couldn't use this tonic excitation input. We had to use uh, rhythmic excitatory inputs to have an external clock. And doing that, we had um, uh, what we were expecting, superficial like cells fire mostly in depth. Uh, each of, this is a raster plot, sorry. So each of these rows is one different uh, neuron. And we have here, yeah, I don't know, thousands of neurons. Uh, well, I am using just one, pyramidal cell. And um, 
what parameters are data time, sorry. Uh, ah, so here we, we see that the superficial like cells fire, fire mostly at the trough and the deep like cells fire mostly like in the, in the peak. But there is no testing without an experiment. So the experiment we were going to perform was turning in the same line as we were talking, turning the, down the PV interneurons in the model. Here we can see what, uh, each of these rows is the uh, spiking histogram of, um, of one synthetic cell with different, all this heterogeneity we have been uh, talking before. And the, the uh, preferred phases are the ones uh, plotted with this black line. And we can see the distribution, the, the preferred theta phase distribution uh, in here, in the bottom panel. And uh, as we uh, could expect, is uh, in the descending part of the, of the theta rhythm. The experiment was, uh, the non-computational experiment was the same thing. We silenced the PB interneurons, uh, the interneurons express, exp uh, yeah, uh, expressing PV in PV cream mice. And the result were, ah, sorry, uh, bo in both a uh, juxtacellular condition uh, with this setup and a multi-site uh, a mu a multi setup. Uh, again, each of these rows is a different neuron. Uh, the spiking uh, histogram along the theta phase of uh, different neurons. And we can see in the bottom panel, uh, the uh, preferred theta phase histogram. So if we compare both um, both uh, distributions, they are statistically the same. So with this, we can now be confident that our model is working. It can predict uh, experimental um, uh, outputs. And it also has uh, uh, achieved uh, non-fitted phenomenon as the, as the bimodality. With all this, we can go back to the basal condition and now study deeper how are the different factor, factors contributing to the output. Um, in here we have, uh, in this panel, we are going to be first uh, looking at this panel, we have the different individuals, the preferred phases of the synthetic cells, I, sorted by different individuals. Each of these four dots uh, uh, are the four morphologies. And they are sorted by the mean uh, preferred theta phase. And what we see here is the expression level of the intrinsic uh, parameters uh, defining each uh, of these individuals. So for example, this individual has a, oh, sorry, and if it's green, then the expression level is high. It means the value of these genes are high. And it is yellow, it means that the, the, the value of these factors are, is low. In this, individ this individual, for example, is defined by a very high um, poten uh, potassium channels, uh, C, KDR, uh, A potassium channels, also high leakage current, and also a high uh, sodium channel, but it has a lower calcium channel and a low uh, M potassium uh, ion density uh, channel. Um, what we saw after comparing the different preferred phases with the different factors is that there is a significant correlation between the phase preference and the expression level of the intrinsic factors. Uh, we can see, for example, uh, the, the um, C potassium uh, ion density channel, uh, the higher it is, the higher is its, uh, its expression, the more nearer to the peak the, the preferred phase is. And while it goes down, it lowers, then the preferred phase tend to go to the trough. We can see that this is uh, shared with other intrinsic parameters, but there's uh, quite the opposite. For example, the axial resistance. The, the lower the axial resistance is, the more, the nearer to the peak is the, the output solution of the, of the neuron. And while it's high, 
that the neuron tends to integrate somehow the inputs during the synthetic cell fire in the trough. Uh, and well, just a comment here, you can see the correlation coefficients and here the p-values. So this is a very, like, a stati very um, a st statistic, it has a, a very high weight in a statistical, uh, in a statistical sense. We can see, we have seen here the intrinsic parameters. Let's go to the morphology, morphological and synaptic parameters. Um, instead of being now sorted by individuals, it's sorted by morphologies and the dots represent the different individuals. And again, here we have the level of expression of different factors, of the excitatory factors in uh, inhibitory and morphological, that is the number of branches of each of these neurons. And here we see that there's a, a statistical correlation in the number of branches and also in the inhibition. Here I think it's pretty clear the, the number of branches because the lower, the less number of branches it has, the, the morphology, near to the peak, to the peak is going to fire. So again, here we, this picture is showing that the different intrinsic, uh, well, also synaptic and morphological factors are determining the the uh, uh, the phase preference of the neuron and somehow contributing to this lower dimension output can go a step further and see the the like the same kind of analysis but with uh, taking into account also not only the basal state but the the experiments we did for example with the cck and the pb and the way of reading this is uh, which is the preferred theta phase when you down regulate the the this factor and how is the theta uh, uh, pref the preferred theta phase when you upregulate this factor? Um, here we can see the results of the CCK and PB experiments. If we lower the CCK, then the neurons will start to fire in the in the peak, and if we lower the PB, then the neuron tends to fire in the descending part. We can see that there's. Uh, uh, I haven't said this, but these are the results that are uh, significantly statist statistically significant. We can see that there, there are more interneurons that uh, contribute to the phase um, out the phase output, like the OLM. Also, some uh, excitatory inputs, and also the what I like for example here the one uh, potassium channel but what i really like is this sodium channel because it's super intuitive how is this working if we have a high uh, sodium uh, ion channel density then uh, well, first of all let's if we remind the uh, excitation starts the excitation starts coming into the theta phase in the peak with entorhinal cortex layer 3 then it uh, then it comes ca3 in the descending part and it go and it ends ends with ca2 and entorhinal cortex layer 2 in the trough so if we have a high value of uh, a high conductor sodium conductance then as soon as any excitatory input comes the neuron will start firing and that's why it's, it fires at the peak. And, uh, but if it's very low, then it's going to be a silent neuron and it needs all the excitation across the different phases to finally uh, fire at the trough. Here we can see again, the results from the previous slide that they also the morphological um, properties are uh, are somehow modeling the this low uh, output the low dim low dimensional output so uh, with all this is showing that the mechanisms underlying the neural activity are multidimensional there is a natural dimensionality reduction uh, performed by neurons and fostered by the nonlinear interaction of multiple factors, including the intrinsic, like the sodium and the potassium, and uh, morphological, such as the number of, uh, of dendrites. 
And I like to see this as a reminder of the importance of a study the, the circuit with all its components. And that we have to make use of these super cool uh, cutting edge technologies that are coming to instead of studying the, the circuit, the, 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 its properties in isolation, try to study them like a whole picture. Uh, I also wanted to say that this is this model is uh, now on GitHub. Uh, my GitHub is my name, basically. And then the model is this one, the Laboratorio de Circuitos Neurales Hippo model. It's, uh, it runs in Python. I use the neuron uh, software, but uh, it's, it's coded, it's called it's Python. And there is a nice documentation also uh, in the GitHub uh, page. So finally, I wanted to thank well everybody in the lab, especially my supervisor, Lisette Menendez de la Prida, and all my colleagues performing the, the experiments. And of course, uh, all you for your attention. <laughs> thank you, Andrea. That was an impressive talk. And thank you for sharing all your software on GitHub. We really appreciate it. Uh, it's <laughs> yeah. useful for the community. So, we have tons of questions, so I am going to try um, and invite um, uh, a few people on stage, if I technically can do that. So uh, the first one will be Alexandra. Um, so let me see if I can do that without crashing everything. Um, ah, I see now the... Di, 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 di. <laughs> Yeah, everybody's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's nice. I mean. All right. So I'm inviting Alexandra. Let's see. Alexandra, I should see your message saying uh, if you want to come online. Oh. Right. Oh, yes. Here I am. Can you guys you hear me? You are online. Yeah. Yes. So, First of all, congratulations. Very impressive work. I've, uh, I've looked at your paper. This is really amazing um, what you've done. Um, I had a few questions uh, just to clarify certain aspects. So you mentioned that I'll start from, from the first one. Um, oh, I just changed the order because of the votes. Uh, so yeah, so the first one, uh, I was wondering whether you looked whether any of your cells are not biologically realistic as they were derived from the evolutionary algorithm. So did you just use the algorithm to create a bunch of cells and then use them all in the model? Or did you test whether any of them were biologically unrealistic to include in the model? Uh, well, for performing the genetic algorithm, we also had like certain restrictions, so the mm. the the values won't become like super unrealistic. So okay. Okay. we didn't, yeah. Apart from that, we didn't like see. Uh, I see. I see. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I understand. And what does lower mean when you said you low? Uh, you said lowering the PV cells, lowering the CCK cells. I don't know what that means in terms of the code, like removing the input yeah, from so those cells to other cells. Yeah, exactly. That's like uh, yeah. So yeah, in the one of uh, our works, we saw that the that uh, the number of connections between CCK and PV was like, for example, with uh, superficials. If you say that, that there's a hundred percent on the superficial, then it's going to be like a thirty percent on the deep, and vice versa. So there's this mm. thirty and one hundred percent. So it's uh, a yeah, yeah and we also perf yeah we also performed an experiment uh, seeing if the connectivity and the the conductivity like the number of synapses and the conductance was equivalent and it was so we could have done it like either way. I see. And when you changed so those parameters, when you changed them, you knew from experiment that it was okay to sort of lower those connections by. 30% or to increase them, like when you yeah. said like from 100, you went to 70, did you know that you could make those manipulations from experimental observations or you just... Uh, no, no, so this uh, like 30 and 100 were from experimental observations. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. From uh, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Sorry. okay, great. 
Um, and the first question that I asked, I didn't understand how the genes corresponded to different intrinsic properties in the pyramidal cell. So when you first designed your evolutionary algorithm, you change, you, you say you change various genes, but I don't understand how that maps on the model. Uh, because yeah, you use so, Bezer's model, yeah. like that doesn't have any genes, of course. It's uh, the intrinsic yeah. property that, yeah. Yeah, so for example, um, you have this uh, morphology and then let's see the axial resistance. It has to be something, it has to have a value. So right. that value was the value from the genetic algorithm. And also you have to have a conductive, uh, for example, an, a sodium or a, a potassium conductivity to okay. uh, so the, the different channels can work. Uh, right. So these numbers were from the genetic algorithm. The numbers were like uh, mm, mm, uh, were on the how do I say? Can I say this? Um, yeah. So they mm, went into the morphology uh, in terms of the like hodgkin hasley equation parameters. Right. Now I understand that. I thought you said genes though, and I thought somehow real <laughs> genes were involved in this process. No, no. Okay. It's because, okay. yeah, so here we have that the, the genetic algorithm, it's called like that because it comes from the like evolutionary okay. Darwin. So genes that, yeah, okay. so yeah, so it's like okay. computational genes that I thought I did this back. Of course, <laughs> you won't see me doing this now, no? Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. And there is just another question under my comment by, uh, that says, moreover, what is the distribution across the dendritic trees and soma? Um, by Maria Psaru under my comment. Uh, but sorry, can you repeat? Ah, uh, yeah. So, so Maria Psaru under my comment, she asks, what is the distribution across the dendritic trees and soma of those? The distribution trees? of... Um, the physical properties, I suppose. The ion channels. And Oh, uh, okay. So I had like, um, I cannot like remember perfectly, but uh, from bibliography, we had like uh, at the SOMA, there's uh, this quantity and then the, it reduces to the 50% in the apical dendrite and then it goes down to a 20% in the distal apical dendrite. So we like multiplied this all because if not you have like thousands of parameters to to fit with the genetic algorithm and that cannot i mean that doesn't work so we did the we maintained like the um, the the um, uh, the di distribution along the uh, the morphology uh, we maintained that and multiply it by the whatever uh, was in the genetic algorithm Mm, let's see. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. So we have a few more questions. Uh, let's see. Laura uh, had a question. I'm not sure if she wants to come on stage. I asked, but I didn't get a response. So let me read the um, let me read the the question. Um, so the choice of the objective function to select and generate the individuals at each step is critical in genetic algorithms especially when there are several target output to satisfy. What is the mathematical expression of your objective function and how much fine tuning did you have to do to, to, to get the results? So this is about the objective function and how do you, did you choose it and what, what is it? Uh, well, I suppose objective function means like the, what I think calling target function, I think. I think so, it would cause function, right. So, well, how do you decide? Yeah. So uh, uh, if, if I recall this properly, I think we used like minimal square error. Uh, so, so at first we wanted just to fit like a curve without any error and that won't work because it's super difficult. So we went to the, uh, we also integrate into the target, uh, the, the target function. Let me see the, if I can, um, this we like, increase this width because uh, also in experiments are uh, there's a um, variability uh, and with this we didn't have to do any much uh, working because it i mean after uh, many generations uh, the neurons end up uh, choosing this uh, like fitting this target function and the thing and i think we the the, the um, optimization was uh, we used minimal square error Great. 
Thank you. And then one last question. This one is from Dieter Jaeger. Um, is there any specific function for NMDA versus AMPA current in the excitatory inputs? And same thing for GABA A, GABA B. Yeah, so that one thing that we wanted to try, but we didn't get to the to that point. We I think we used only uh, GABA A, and also uh, we did we didn't get to per, uh, to add. Um, ah, how do you call it? NM NMDA? Sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> More fast synaptic transmission. So you had very yeah. fast synaptic transmission in this model. Okay, got it. Yeah. Great, thank you very much, Andrea, good job. And uh, I will uh, drop you from the screen and invite our next speaker, Nathan Schulteis from uh, Florida International University, the psychology department. So let's see if I can find Nathan. All right, and we go. So we're running a little bit late. Uh, I hope that's okay, five, 10 minutes. Uh, so Nathan, um, you know, take the time that you normally have. Don't worry about the absolute time. The next session is a poster session uh, on the hour. So we have a little bit of time. Nathan. Let's see, am I here? Oh, there you go. I can see you now. Great. Great, welcome. Thank you, thank you. Try and share your screen so we can get started. Yeah. Let me, uh... Okay. So we don't see Let's anything. see, is this a... Uh... But it should be. I don't know why it's uh doesn't seem to want to let me do that. So if I just uh, all right. So you disappeared. I'm going to I guess screen by two. All right, we can see you. Okay, if I go to share screen again, am I coming? Is my audio coming through? Your audio is fine. Your we can see your uh, your video stream. We cannot see okay. your slides. So. Sorry. Um, Okay, it worked, it worked when you practiced it. Yeah, it sure did. Okay. Whatever you did then. Yep, so now it started responding. So uh, do you see my mouse on the shared screen right now? I do not see your shared screen. Oh, you don't? Jeez. Nope. I can see you. Okay. Um, when I click on share screen through the app or through the browser, it doesn't respond. All right, so we have some admins online. If they can help out, that'd be great. I, I don't know what to do here since I have you. Hmm. Uh, I have share screen for me, but that's not what we want. So do you see, you don't see um, anything on my computer at all, right? All right, so somebody on the chat uh, window says you may want to reset uh, your browser. Okay, so shall I just close that and then start over again? Yes, you go ahead and I will. Okay, thanks. Maintain the link. All right, my apologies to everybody. It's just a little pitch. So Nathan is 
restarting his browser. Yeah, reloading might not be the, the best, but it should be just a matter of a minute. So I'm All back. Right, we, we have you back. Try to reshare your screen again, maybe. Yeah. My. Now it's showing me. Oh, this is unfortunate. Now I'm unable to get certain Crowdcast windows off of the screen here. Let's, there we go. Okay, let's try this. I do have a little red. Ah, here we go. Okay. Let's see if this works. All right, so, uh, okay, so see, does that work? No, I can't see it. It says it's thinking now, where it used to say uh, just share uh, screen. Yeah, you, you, you're, you're on. So whatever okay, you do. Right. <laughs> okay, sorry about all this. Um, okay. You want to go into full screen mode maybe? To yeah, for sure. Cool. And I'll let you just take it away. All right. It will actually respond now. That would be great. Okay, one quick question. Do you see my mouse on the screen? Okay. How about you jiggle your mouse a little bit, see if I can see it. I'm moving it back and forth. What about here? Yeah? I do not see the mouse. Okay, well, I'll just try to use verbal cues as best okay. I can. Uh, okay. Actually, so, we're not seeing your full presentation. This is still the... Uh, is this working? Yeah. So this is not full screen. So so we're, we're you're probably screen. sharing the wrong screen. Yeah. Uh, so swap presenter and slide. Seems like it should work. How about now? All right. It's still. Still. The it's slide. just telling the the presenter. This is not a presenter mode. Now this is the you know we can see all the slides on the left hand hand side and. Oh. and Really, I can't even see that. That's interesting. Okay. Um, you should share your entire screen, somebody said. That may help. Yeah, let me see if it will, I will ask me what share. Okay. Screen. Let's go with screen one. Okay, should be thinking now. Okay, so this is the same as before. I do not know why this worked the other day. And now All right, so it's not too bad if you if you just maximize your slides quite a bit. Like take out maybe the right hand side if you can. I'm not sure if you can move the uh, short of yeah right. Uh, it's not ideal. Right. But if you can't, if you can't do it, then maybe we should show. It. Yeah, it's uh, and this is still showing you that same oh, piece. No, right? this is better. Is it uh, full screen now? No, this this is now we can see we can see the slides and then your next animation. Uh, on the I slide. see. Okay, so then let me try this and see if this makes everything happy. Ah, you got it. This okay, is it. great. All right, so you can see me. You can see the talk. Correct. correct. 
Wonderful. Okay, so good morning or good afternoon, depending upon uh, where in the world you are. Uh, this is actually the first time I've given this talk, and so I uh, thank the organi organizers of CNS uh, for giving me the opportunity. Um, first of all, this work is done in collaboration between Tom Galarte's lab here at Florida International University, FIU, and uh, this work was actually done in Tim Allen's lab. I work for Tim. Uh, and uh, the Galarte lab is primarily focused on neurotoxicology, whereas Tim Allen's lab is focused on neurobiology of cognition uh, using a range of electrophysiology and uh, circuit manipulation techniques. So, um, there we go. Seems to be advancing at a strange rate. So, uh, so my title is a little bit of a mouthful, um, but uh, the paper on this work, today's work, is going to be coming out in behavioral neuroscience very soon. Uh, if you want to access the preprint, then uh, maybe note down that number there. And uh, with the Galarte Lab, we also have a, uh, a companion paper on the effects of lead neurotoxicity on some of the things I'm going to be talking about today. So uh, this is a bit of a mouthful of a title. So first of all, let me break it down for you. Uh, I'm going to be focused on what we're calling, for our purposes, awake delta uh, and the theta rhythm. Uh, and these are something that I like to refer to as modes of hippocampal network activity. Uh, and then the, I'm going to be looking at these modes or uh, talking about these modes during just uh, basic locomotor behavior in the rat. Uh, so by way of introduction, uh, this is a depiction of the theta rhythm. Um, if you could just let me know if you can actually see my mouse currently. Is, is this showing up? Well, I'm not hearing anything. So, uh, so these uh, these traces are recorded from a depth probe uh, yeah, we into. Can see it. Don't worry. We're good. I'm sorry, we can see. Okay, it. okay, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, this is a depth probe used to record um, the local field potential at uh, various depths throughout CA1. Uh, up here at the top, the pyramidal cell layer is about here, uh, down into the stratum lacanosum moleculare and into the dentate gyrus below. So you can see that there's a profile of uh, the theta rhythm, which is pretty well known. I, I would expect that most of us are somewhat familiar with it. Uh, and uh, for our purposes right now, we're defining the theta rhythm as six to 10 hertz. Um, delta is a bit of a um, uh, more complicated thing to discuss because the field has a lot of different perspectives on it. Uh, one of which is, uh, again, from the Bizaki lab, a 4 hertz oscillation that's within what we would call delta, which is the 1 to 4 hertz uh, frequency band. Um, you can see that a 4 hertz oscillation emerges in PFC and, uh, and the prefrontal cortex and the ventral tegmental area uh, during a working memory task. There's also a very different uh, definition of delta, which is during slow wave sleep. Uh, so polymorphic slow wave sleep looks like this. These are local field potential recordings. And in each one of these columns here, you can see depicted a, a delta wave, sort of a singular event. Uh, and the way this has been uh, typically conceived is uh, as a moment of cortical silence. Now, if you look at rasters from prefrontal cortex that are depicted below here, um, you'll notice that there's really no spiking in prefrontal cortex during these delta waves. And so it's been thought of maybe a reset period or some, for whatever reason, a moment of silence. However, very recently it's been shown, as you can see in this uh, circled uh, region right here, that sometimes spikes occur. So you can call those delta spikes, if you will. Uh, this is from uh, Todorova and Zugaro just recently, uh, a few months ago. Um, and uh, actually a, an, an additional figure from that paper shows three different delta waves uh, that have uh, delta spikes occurring during them. And what, what the authors show in a variety of ways is that hippocampal activity prior to these delta waves is predictive of which neurons are active during those delta waves. And uh, this, this can be shown to be related to subsequent memory. Um, so you have an awake version and a sleep version. Uh, there are differences in frequency band that I'm going to talk about. But first of all, let me give you a, a sense of what our setup was. We are recording local field potentials. Everything I'm going to talk about today is local field potential. Uh, so the, the way that we do that is we have a rat running around in what we call an open field environment. Uh, while we take video of him from two cameras above, uh, and in this case, the rat has no task, just completely uh, free navigation wandering around this environment. And you can see on the floor here, 
during a, a roughly 40 minute session everywhere that the rat went. This is called the rat's trajectory, uh, not surprisingly. And uh, this is would be a session that had really good coverage, meaning the rat went everywhere within that environment. Uh, this is an actual photograph of the environment. Uh, we dimly illuminate it during um, recording sessions so that it's red. Uh, rats don't see red very well, and I'm not sure if you can make this out, but there are black curtains that go floor to ceiling on either side. Uh, the, the experimenter has essentially no interaction with the rat, and uh, like I said, there's no task. So uh, hanging here from the recording apparatus above is a head stage that contains uh, green and blue uh, LEDs that we use to track the head of the animal. Um, this is what our tracking actually looks like. So you can see with the two cameras that we use, sort of, I call this a dark field and a light field camera. Uh, you can track the LEDs on the rat's head um, in this, with this camera, and we track the rat's body with the second camera. Uh, and then we map these two cameras onto one another, so we have a momentary estimate of where the rat's body is and where the rat's head is at all times. Uh, that is relevant for a piece of data I'll show you at the very end if I have time. So our uh, recordings are done with NeuroNexus probes. These are silicon probes that have eight tetrodes on them, um, uh, distributed across four shanks. So we have two different depths uh, where we're recording from on each of four positions that are oriented medial lateral or along the proximal distal axis of CA1. Uh, a second recording setup that we use that is relevant to, to addition, one additional figure I'll also try to show you uh, before the end uh, is these are handcrafted or, or um, custom made, I should say, in the lab. They're 3D printed um, recording bodies that have an electrode interface board in them and then any really any confirmation of electrodes that we'd like to uh, record from. So in these uh, recordings, we have 18 hippocampal electrodes and then 14 in um, medial prefrontal cortex. Uh, and that could be printed out and, like I said, any confirmation. And once we are recording, after um, after the experiment's over, we can do the histology and you see these eight red circles here, hopefully, that reflect the eight recording sites from a silicon probe. And these are some dual uh, recording, uh, some a brain that had uh, dual recordings done and you can see a few hippocampal sites for these stainless steel electrodes and a few pre prefrontal cortex sites. Okay, so this is what the data basically looks like, and I'm also going to use it as a bit of a summary slide. So um, this is the local field potential, uh, just an example trace that we recorded. Uh, and local field potential, of course, ref reflects synchrony among uh, membrane currents, which, is, which are largely synaptic currents. And therefore, they reflect the local network activity as well as potentially long-range inputs. If we uh, filter this raw LFP trace in different frequency bands, we can see the theta, uh, rhythm emerge, and we can see delta frequency activity, uh, and we can plot this as a function of the movement speed of the animal. So local field potential, uh, so in a nutshell, what I'm going to be talking about today is a relationship, or sort of dual relationships between theta and delta and the behavior of the animal. So what you can see uh, in the in a nutshell part here is that theta is really prominent when the animal tends to be moving around, uh, but on in moments where the rat stops moving and is, and is very still, you can see sort of this uh, coincident, if not synchronous, emergence of, of delta at those moments. So this is more of a, a theta half of a trace and this is more of a delta half of a trace. Uh, but the way that rats actually run around when they're not doing a task is, is, is this sort of, I call it uh, creeping. They'll run a few steps or maybe a, uh, several steps if they have somewhere that they're trying to get to, but they'll pause very often. And during these pauses is when uh, the delta pops up almost immediately. And that is an observation that at least hasn't been treated very uh, strongly in the literature. So just to give you an additional... Sorry to interrupt, but we can see your mouse now if you want to use it, feel free. Okay, uh, right here. You see me going in a circle with the mouse? Oh, no? a minute ago. Just for a moment. Maybe it's a refresh thing, because I've actually been using the mouse, mouse to point, so hopefully I haven't lost. Feel free uh, to use it anyway if you like, but uh, sometimes okay. we do see it. Okay, so hopefully, yeah, it's actually flashing for me now. So maybe this is just a memory issue or something like that. But uh, in any case, I'll try to, to be a little bit more conscious of uh, describing verbally instead of assuming that you see where I'm pointing. Uh, so the question becomes, um, if delta is in fact related to the uh, moments in time where the rat is stationary uh, and theta is related to 
the moments in time when the rat is running, do these actual do these different hippocampal modes of activity or just the the uh, synchrony profile reflect different things cognitively? So is the if you will, if the rat is the rat thinking about something different when he stops and pauses in amidst the intermittent pattern of his running behaviors. So let me do another in nutshell uh, image here. The idea being to just show you the thing. If it's there, you believe me. If it's not there, you don't believe me. But if you look at the spectrogram, which shows the power and the different frequency bands across a recording session, this is about 20 minutes of a recording session. And I've overlaid the running speed of the animal here in white. What you can see is that when the running speed goes big, when it goes up, there tend to be really red dots here in the spectrogram in the theta band. Uh, so this is theta indicated at about eight hertz. And when the rat stops moving, you see what, what I, I think of this looking like a rainstorm or something like that. You see delta raining down from theta at these moments. Now there's a couple of caveats to looking at a spectrogram. One is that you have a time window across which the uh, power spectrum is taken. And so this is not gonna be uh, on the time scale of fractions of a second, but rather two seconds in this case for each time window, which approaches how rapidly a, a rat can change his uh, behavior, but uh, is, is not necessarily perfect. So it's good, a good idea to do some of these analyses in multiple ways. So uh, taking the longer time scale approach, we can see that both delta and theta appear to be related in some way to movement speed. So the power spectral density across the entire session shows activity in both of those frequency bands. You see this really large theta peak uh, and you see sort of a shoulder or in some cases a, a distinct peak in the delta band. Um, however, if you focus on uh, smaller time windows than the entire session, uh, for example, the red and the blue that I've highlighted below here, uh, sorry, the green and the blue that I've highlighted below here, the, during the green window, the animal is running and during the blue animal, the animal, or during the blue window, the animal is very stationary. And you can see that the frequency composition of the local field potential is very different, with there being more power in delta when the animal is stationary and more power in theta when the animal is running. Now, the delta trace here looks like it's quite distributed over a number of different frequency bands. And of course, it is. And you can look at the window and see that uh, within the spectrogram, uh, the, the time frame of that, of that moment. Um, but it's a long time window. These windows are 36 seconds long. And so activity at different mo moments in time is not captured by the PSD from those longer time windows. So uh, this is just another example. So you can see these rain showers coming down. There's, this animal is running a lot more consistently. Or, uh, so you see a lot more theta throughout this session. And again, this is when an animal is not, doesn't have a particular task. Some animals tend to be very exploratory and others tend to be relatively sedentary. So, like I said, the, the PSD is not necessarily uh, the only way that we want to look at these things. If we look at the raw LFP filtered in the different frequency bands, delta, theta, and fast gamma in this instance, we can take the peaks and troughs of every peak and trough of this signal throughout the session, throughout these filtered um, versions of the local field potential, and plot the amplitude, the peak to trough amplitude for every half cycle, right? So, you, the left and right side of, the, of each uh, oscillatory cycle. You can see that if we do that, they, th these dots in delta, for example, are going up and then they drop down towards the middle and they go up again and they drop down. So if, you, if your eye can follow that in the trace below, the filter trace below, it obviously gives a nice uh, readout of what the amp momentary amplitude of uh, delta, theta, and fast gamma are. And if we take uh, small time windows or large time windows, I believe this is one second time windows, and take the average amplitude within a sliding one second window, as the animal is running around, uh, we see that delta seems to have a negative relationship to running speed, which makes sense based on what we saw in the spectrogram, whereas theta and high gamma are positively correlated. Theta and high gamma have been known to be positively correlated uh, with running speed for a long time. Uh, that information has been used in a number of models of spatial navigation, dead reckoning, uh, if some of these terms make, uh, are familiar to folks. Um, but uh, the spatial navigation literature uses theta for uh, quite a number of different things. But in general, uh, I would conceive of it as a coordinating influence within hippocampus and also between uh, parahippocampal structures and prefrontal cortex. So it's a coordinating influence. Uh, what delta is doing here is not known currently. It's um, not been observed to be modulated by running speed, uh, but this, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Uh, however, 
in this case, when we analyze theta in the same way, we do see a similar um, relationships, be, relationship between running speed and delta. Uh, and this, so, uh, this is just a second example of the same thing, uh, where animals run less often, as you can see from the trajectory plot, but faster when he does. Um, and these are all male rats, so I say he. Um, so uh, what we can do by um, taking extractions from, from all of our recording sites, so we're using a 32 channel system and we have six rats in, in this data. So we end up with whatever that multiplied is number of channels. So we can take for each channel that we recorded from the correlation coefficient between running and uh, between running speed and each uh, of those rhythms, the amplitude of each of those rhythms. So across all of those 150 or however many uh, recording channels that comes out to be, we see that the correlation coefficients are almost entirely negative for delta. So this is just a really strong way of saying that almost always this relationship between running speed and delta is true. Uh, we don't see a slow gamma effect. That's a very complicated subject uh, right now in the field. Uh, but we see very positive relationships between running speed and theta and running speed and fast gamma. As I said, that's already known. Uh, if we do a four uh, predictor regression where we predict running speed on each of those four um, rhythms then or I should say oscillatory frequency bands um, rhythm can be somewhat of a uh, loaded term but we get beta values for each of those um, of those uh, oscillatory bands and again the delta and delta and actually slow gamma in this case show negative relationships to running speed and theta and fast gamma show positive relationships in terms of the, the betas from that regression analysis. Now, this is just a caveat. Um, what I wanna say here is that this is by no means a complete story of what's going on uh, with the different rhythms. Uh, we saw considerable, considerable variability uh, between recording sites uh, for the relationships between rhythms. So in this case, the black plots here at the bottom are just histograms of the correlation coefficients, similar to what I already showed you, but in this case, between the uh, different rhythms. So theta to gamma on the left, delta to theta in the middle, and delta to gamma on the right. And you can see multiple peaks in these cases. So what that suggests is the possibility that uh, the different uh, uh, rhythms or the different frequency bands have different relationships to one another uh, under different circumstances. So if three different things are happening, you might expect to see three different peaks uh, in the relationships between the different frequency bands. So uh, I'm not going to go into this uh, in greater detail just because it, uh, it could go on forever. But um, in addition to the many different relationships that may exist between different frequency bands, we can already see that there's a lot of things going on in the spectrogram. Um, so this is just another example uh, of a spectrogram showing the rain showers, like I was telling you. But if you look with a, a fine detail, you, you see that in some cases, theta is very high. Some, in some cases, there's a, what seems to be a combination of theta and delta, in other cases, purely delta. Um, so I naively wanted to ask how many different things are going on in the spectrogram. So if you take two second windows and run and, and calculate the power spectral density from all two second windows throughout a recording session, I then applied um, a clustering algorithm to that to, to, in a naive way, allow it to tell me how many different things are going on. Now, in this case, I'm just using the linkage function, which is a, a built-in MATLAB function. Um, but really, any uh, clustering algorithm can be used with different caveats. I've tried several, but there's quite a bit uh, more work that could be done on this. These are just two examples that show a whole bunch of modes, if you will or instantaneous uh, power spectral densities, I should say, um, in the, that have a theta peak, and many of them also have a delta peak that's off, off to the left of these plots. Um, and there's some variability within animals and some var variability between animals, but they almost all show this general profile of a whole bunch of stuff happening in theta and a whole bunch of stuff happening in delta. If I then cluster those based on the dendrograms that are inset here, I get different modes is what I would call them, spectral modes. Uh, that have different frequency compositions, basically different patterns of behavior. So for those two examples I just showed you, on the left here are 16 different putative spectral modes, you might say, and you see that they tend to fall either in the delta range or the peaks of power tend to fall either in the delta range or in the theta range. Uh, I plotted those on top of each other here on the right. But now from those different categorizations of PSDs, 
I'll say it again in a different way, from those different modes that were given to me simply naively by clustering the spectrogram, I get um, um, I, measures that I can make for the different frequency bands. And so here is one of the main points of, uh, of the paper that I, that I mentioned earlier, and it's that delta power and theta power across modes appear to be orthogonal, meaning essentially that there's a right angle uh, between the power in the two bands. So uh, the way I would describe that is that all of the variants, if you will, all of the different values that delta power takes on occur at the lowest values of theta, whereas all of the larger inflated um, accentuated values of theta occur when delta is very weak. So this would be an orthogonality between the two. Um, so the other, uh, a, an initial way that this kind of analysis is useful uh, is because, the, or a second way I should say, is not only can you look at the average behavior of the power spectral density itself, but what a mode is, is all of the instances in time where a particular pattern or where a power spectral density that was categorized in a particular way occurred. So it's the incidence of all of those moments. And if I want the average power spectrum, I just take it across all of those instances. But I can also take other values as a um, uh, at all of those times to compare those. So uh, a couple of the last things I wanna show you here, uh, actually, yes, the very last things I wanna show you here are if we take all of those moments and we plot intrahippocampal delta power, then we see this orthogonality that I was describing before, because when the animal runs fast, we tend to get theta and low delta, and when the animal's moving slowly, we see delta. Uh, and theta power correlates with movement speed across these modes. But more interestingly, perhaps when we take the um, medial prefrontal cortex to hippocampus coherence, we see a monotonic relationship in each uh, between each of these uh, rhythms and the theta power, theta delta power ratio, which is a psychiatric tool that's used in a number of cases. But so what this says is that delta coherence decreases, delta coherence between medial prefrontal cortex and hippocampus decreases uh, as the theta delta ratio increases. So when you have, um, and the theta coherence increases with a larger theta delta power ratio. So what this suggests is that the interaction between hippocampus and prefrontal cortex, um, the interaction between the two follows the actual spectral content themselves. So when we see modes that have a lot of delta, the delta coherence team tends to be higher. Uh, and when bet between the two structures and when, the, when we have a lot of theta, the theta coherence tends to be higher. So uh, the take-home messages are simply that delta may be functionally important for episodic memory. Uh, in this case, I didn't talk about episodic memory at all, but if you imagine one of these intermittent trajectories of locomotion, that, that is essentially conceivable as different um, events that are strung together. And so if during those different events strung together, you're alternating between theta and delta modes, perhaps delta is also an important part of the encoding that's going on. And the second take home is simply that clustering the spectrogram is a powerful way to distinguish network modes. Uh, there are many extensions of this that we're currently working on, uh, one of which is clustering the, the uh, coherence between two regions. Um, but with that, I need to, to say thank you and take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Nathan. I think we are running a little bit out of time. Uh, just to remind everybody, you can post your question on our star and Nathan can can answer them uh, over there. I have a very, very quick question. Uh, uh, so all of your, or of your experiments, the data that you that, that you got are for foraging experiments, is that correct? Uh, they're not, there's no okay. task whatsoever. We did the parallel of all okay. of this during a foraging task, but uh, all of the data, just for purposes of artifacts and motivational state and that kind of thing, the data that I'm showing here is just absolutely nothing other than the rat wandering. So my, my question is, you know, do you expect anything different if the rat had to use yeah. speed for a particular reason, right? So if speed is actually informational or if speed is, allows the rat to do something versus something else, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the case, especially in the case of memory, when it, it becomes right. Relevant. Right. So um, that's an interesting question because normally my answer would begin, uh, that it, depending upon what task the animal's doing, you would certainly expect different, let's call them thoughts, uh, that the rat may be engaged in, and therefore different modes would go along with that. But it sounds like if what you're suggesting is something different than the normal question, uh, which is that running speed itself is informational for what the rat is doing. Um, that would be a great instance where you might express, express uh, when you might ex 
expect, excuse me, a combination of uh, rhythms present because I, I like to use the abstract terms here, but if the, if the animal is running around mindlessly, then you may expect to see purely a theta move. Whereas if the animal is thinking about something or potentially encoding or potentially retrieving for memory guided behavior, or if that animal is actually having to be conscious of their running speed in order to uh, use that information in some way, as you were describing, then yeah, you might expect to see a different pattern uh, in the power spectral density and different coherence between structures because the circuit would be engaged in a different way uh, for those cognitive uh, tasks as opposed to when, in this, as in this case, the, there is no task to be performing. So. Great, thank you very much. I, I, wouldn't, I don't know of anything that, of any tasks where a person has actually used the running speed as informational, however. So it's, uh, it's a little bit hand -wave. Great. Thanks a lot. Oh, there is one more question. Let me see if I can. Um, all right. One, one question for Alexandra. What made you choose above six hertz, uh, six to 10 hertz as a range for theta? Interesting choice. People usually choose four to three hertz. Four to three? Uh, well, so um, maybe there, depending upon the system you talk about and depending upon the experimenter that you talk about, Four to 12 is one range, five to 10, six to 10. Really, everyone has titrated their own data ranges, I would say, unless somebody has a favorite and hopefully that doesn't offend anyone. But um, for my purposes, the theta peak is almost always uh, between six and 10. Um, I've used five and 10 as well, uh, which doesn't change anything. Uh, to, dis to distinguish from delta, it is kind of, uh, it it's relevant to have a little bit of a gap between the two ranges, one to four and six to 10. Um, but having played with all of that, it really doesn't matter in, in terms of these analyses. In some cases, I use the area under the power spectral, dense under the PSD. In other cases, I use the actual peak. Uh, and really nothing that you manipulate in those kinds of ways affects the, uh, the, the qualitative result. Thank you very much. The poster session is starting, so we need we need to quit here. And again, uh, all the questions that you have, additional questions, can be uh, posted on norstar.org. There is a link in the chat window. Thanks, Nathan. Appreciate it. And sorry about the appreciate your time. Okay. Bye bye.